Sound Design. I had a really smart professor, and the day he taught me, you get the work you get because of the people you know and what they think of you, and not because of what you know. A light bulb clicked. Sound Design. Sound Design Live is produced independently by me, Nathan Lively, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the home of the world's best online training and sound system tuning that you can do at your own pace from anywhere in the world. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by system engineer at Lady Antebellum and master sound engineer at the Guthrie Theater, Alex Ritter. Alex, welcome to Sound Design Live. Hey, thanks for having me. I want to find out uh, kind of what music you're into. When you are playing test tracks on a sound system that are music, um, do you play music that you like? Or do you play things that work well for being test tracks? Uh, both. Okay. <laughs> uh, so tell me what you when like I'm to play. When I'm by <laughs> myself and I've done my job, then I'll certainly listen to what I want. Okay. No, I think for system optimization and making sure that the system's what I want it to be, I use things that are good for that, not necessarily things I like. I don't like Marcone, but he's got some really good tracks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's one that you would pick to, to put on if you were by yourself and... You wanted to have fun, I guess, and do your job at the same time. Mm, Michael Jackson. I feel like what you're telling me is that you don't want to have any information below 80 hertz. Is that what you're telling me? (laughs) Sometimes. So, Alex, what are you doing in Minneapolis? Uh, Well, I work here at the Guthrie. um, You live here. I do. And we're in the Guthrie today. We are. What is the Guthrie? So the Guthrie, it's uh, one of the largest uh, regional theaters in the country. Um, we are our own producing house. We're Lord A House. We've got three theaters in the building, um, a thrust, which is what we're known for, um, a proscenium, and then a black box up on the ninth floor. Just out of curiosity, how do they measure largest? Is that um, number of occupants? Yep. Capacity? capacity. Okay, so yeah, what is so the like capacity a, for people who don't know Lord A, B, C, D? Right, so uh, a Lord A is... 500 and above, Lort B is no more than 500. I really have to look it up, what the numbers actually are. But like, okay. a, a but you Lord, know the capacity of this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So like the, the proscenium is 679. Okay. Uh, the thrust is 899, something like that. And the mm-hmm. black box is 200, 199. What is master sound engineer? Is this a thing common with theaters? I haven't seen this anywhere else. Uh, yeah, it's... It's a different title for a lot of positions that are out there. Uh, If you're doing Broadway stuff, it would be production sound engineer. Um, If uh, it's the equivalent of a master electrician from a lighting department. Okay. Um, Basically head of department. Yeah. Head of department. Well, no, not head of department. Uh, Here we're at the Guthrie, we're structured where we have a department head that is non-union. The Guthrie is a union building. Um, All the labor is union. So the masters are at the top of the union ladder, Got it. but underneath the department head, who is non-union. Okay. My job is systems. I generate paperwork. Um, I tune the systems. I make sure the designers get what it is they want or what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. I basically have the inside knowledge of how the stuff works. Right. right? And then we have the operators that move the faders um, and press the buttons. Run the shows. And run the shows. Yeah. Uh, I have a nine to five. I'm... Rarely here past 4.30, unless we're in tech rehearsals. And sure. then um, we usually sit in tech and make sure the designer's happy. And if he wants a speaker moved or something changed added, we take care of that. Tell me how you got your first job in audio. Um, like your first paying gig. My first paying gig. So I started in audio in high school. I I broke the sound system in our high school auditorium. <laughs> Had to fix it. Yeah. That's how they got your first job. No, yeah. what happened? Um, well, so it, every Wednesday we had assembly, and in that assembly we had to sit with our advisors, and our advisors were seated alphabetically by row. My advisor's last name started with Z, so okay. guess where we got to sit? <laughs> in the last row. Um, <laughs> and I could never understand anything, and I saw there's a person with a microphone, and I saw the speaker, and their sound booth was right behind me. So, like, I, somebody was in there, and mm-hmm. I figured, well... I can figure this out. It shouldn't be too hard. So one day after school, I snuck in and um, I broke it. 
I ended up plugging the amp output back into the console, which is like a Mackie something, uh-huh. and it completely fried the desk. Oh, I wow. Mean, you know. Good work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's my first experience with a feedback loop. Okay. Um, it was an interesting experience. And as, as a punishment, as opposed to being expelled or having to pay for the whole thing, they said, okay, well, you're going to have to learn how to use this. Mm-hmm. And the, the school did three shows a year. And then a bunch of concerts, you know, band, choir, all that stuff, plus assemblies. And they used to hire this guy in, Kevin Little, from Productions Unlimited. I'll never forget him. I, I essentially owe my career to Kevin. Like, okay. he's, he's the one who ended up starting it all off. Um, so I ended up having to help Kevin with the musical, like, a couple months later. And we fixed the system, and he explained to me what an XLR is, and kind of the basics of signal flow, you know, mm-hmm. microphone, cable, console, processor, speaker, amplifier, speaker. And that, so that was my, like my beginning of sophomore year. And by the middle of junior year, he had kind of taught himself out of a job um, oh, wow. where I was starting to run all of the events nice. um, and all that stuff. They still brought him in for the musicals, thankfully, because I still had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> um, but I thought I did because I was 16 and I had, sure. he kind of put me under his wing Mm -hmm. and uh, carried me all the way through high school. Um, And then my senior year, he introduced me to the Little Theater where he ran sound most of the time. He couldn't do a show, so he asked if I wanted to run sound there. And that was my first paying gig. Um, Greenville Little Theater in South Carolina. Um, Mm -hmm. And that led to being friends with the TD, who was also a stagehand um, at a local amusement park where they had a big you know, 12,000 seat shed. I started there over the summers and that led to meeting other people and going to college and working and all that fun stuff. But yeah, my first paying job was Green the Little Theater. Sound of Music. Awesome. (laughs) I'm wondering if maybe you could pick a point where you felt like you made a decision to, that, that really changed things for you. If there was like a turning point or what could you identify as, you know, one of the best decisions you made to get more of the work that you really love? Mm -hmm. I think I can take it back to college. Um, I had a really smart professor, and the day he taught me, you get the work you get because of the people you know and what they think of you, Mm -hmm. and not because of what you know, a light bulb clicked. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I kind of made the decision to be nice to people, right, and create contacts, Mm -hmm. and cultivate those as best as I can. I hope that every job I leave, I've left a good impression neutral impression at worst you know i hope i've (laughs) never left a negative impression on someone um but you know it's he made a good point we're in a service industry Mm -hmm. and i think the the day you realize that is the day you actually get more jobs sure because you're at the service of someone whether it's an engineer a band a client you know a director a sound designer what contact should i be making if you were sort of to go back 20 years and, and talk to yourself 20 years ago that light bulb went off in your head and you're like, oh, I need to be nice to people and be making contacts. Could you do that specifically then and identify maybe job titles that you should be making contacts with or specific people in specific places? I think it depends on where you want to focus. If you want to focus in theater designers, you want to make contacts with designers. Because it's often the sound designers who either hire or uh, say, I want to work with this sound engineer or system tech or whatever. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, for, for a Broadway show, the designer makes has a lot of influence on who gets hired. The general manager ends up doing the hiring, but the designer has a lot of say on who gets hired for their team. Because sure. we're the designer's tool, right? We are how he accomplishes his vision. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going down rock and roll, you production, um, production managers, front of house engineers, monitor engineers if you want to end up in monitors. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people start with a specific band in a club. You know, also not a bad thing, but those people typically stay with that band and then don't really go anywhere else. Yeah. So I think production managers, front of house engineers. Cool. I want to know basically how you got this job and how you got the job on the last tour. Mm -hmm. And then basically how you were able to kind of do those at the same time, because that sounded like it it was really tough. So let's start with um, let's start with the Guthrie. How did you get the job at the Guthrie? We moved to Minneapolis five years ago in 2013. Fleeing um, the law, probably. Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally <laughs> ran away from the NYPD. Um, no, I followed my wife, you know, much like most moves. I moved to New York yeah, because of familiar. my wife, right? <laughs> you moved here uh, because of that. So, yeah, I followed my wife. Uh, she was the producer at the Children's Theater. 
Uh, she got a job there. We were having kids and didn't want to live in New York anymore. Children's uh, theater here is great. Yeah, it's awesome. I really like it. I, I like working there when I get to work there with Sten. Mm-hmm. My wife made a connection between uh, their music director, Victor, um, and myself, and we sat down and chatted, and Victor passed my name along to Scott Edwards, who was the department head here at the time. Um, and he sent me an email, said, hey, I got your contact information from Victor. Want to know if you want to come by sometime and take a look at the venue. And I had no idea what the Guthrie was. Well, and uh, Victor told him that you were a sound designer or a system tech or just an audio person. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, we had moved here. I was in the middle of doing a bunch of Broadway shows and Zach Brown at the same time, um, which was also a poor idea okay. <laughs> uh, to do that many things at once. Um, Mixing them? Or what was your... Uh, I was production on a bunch of Troika tours. Okay. Um, Troika is a tour producer. That year, they did like five or six shows, and I was helping out a friend. So I helped him out on three or four of those as a production engineer. And then for Zach, I was a systems tech. Victor knew that I was a sound engineer, and I was in town trying to start somewhat of a local career. I didn't want to continue to fly back to New York or tours you know, uh, with a kid on the way, I kind of wanted something local. Sure. Um, so, uh, Victor passed my info along to, to Scott and, uh, Scott sent me an email. I came by, I was super impressed with the facility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's 10 stories tall, yeah. but, you know, when, <laughs> when you hear regional and theater, is that counting this crazy giant, um, sign on top, what is that thing called? What do you call those things? The led sign with the words the on LED it tower. that go up yeah, into the sky. That thing is crazy. Every time I drive by, I'm like, whose idea was that? <laughs> Jean Nouvel. He's French. Okay. Um, anyway, yes, it's a big building mm-hmm. is what you're trying to say. Yeah, big building, uh, super complicated system. And I, I was really worried when I left New York that I was going to slide backwards right. career-wise. You know, right. typically when Midwest. you go from New York to um, a medium-sized town you're like oh the theater is gonna be great i'm gonna be on a mackie 1202 for the rest of my life you know um but the stuff here is amazing you yeah. know we have stuff that nobody else has we've got a really complicated system and right, let's talk about it i mean yeah. we don't have to go through every piece in the signal chain but there is a unique mix system here mm-hmm. um so talk about the mix system and then um maybe get into the sound system itself beyond the console yeah um, so the system here, it's based around Stage Tech Nexus. Um, it's a German product, like all good audio products. Are, um, <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> <laughs> I don't have any bias towards German products at all. Um, but uh, there's very few in the country. ESPN has the largest Nexus install. We have the second largest in the country. Uh, there's some Broadway tours now that are starting to pop up with uh, some Nexus backbones. But as far as mixing surface, um, we have two stage tech Auruses. We're capable of handling 128 in by 128 out on them. And it's we have the only two in the Midwest. There's one in New York. Kai Harada likes to use them. Um, Wait, who's Kai Harada? Uh, he's a Broadway sound, sound designer. designer. Okay. Uh, he was the associate on Wicked. I hope you're happy. I hope you're happy now. And he's done a bunch of stuff okay. since then. I feel like that console just sits at Sound Associates most of the time. Um, I call Greg Reef every once in a while, who's one of the uh, shop managers, account managers at Sound Associates when we have, when we need Sound spare Associates, parts. Sound Associates, it's one of the bigger rental and production companies in New York, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the three big Broadway rental shops yeah. um, out there. The nice thing about it is it, this whole building is wired with fiber and Nexus runs on a fiber backbone. So we can do our rehearsals in the recording studio on the first floor. Our main stages are on the fourth and fifth floor. And we can have, for the musical, our orchestra down here and pipe that into the thrust. Super easy. So the wild thing that, that I want people to understand who have not taken a tour of the Guthrie is that there's basically a machine room where the brain lives. Mm-hmm. And everywhere else is, is basically just big control surfaces. Yeah. There's, there's no processing. Keyboard and mouse. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Everything else is just control. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no audio that passes through the consoles other than a talkback mic and your headphone jack. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you, you could only do that with fiber, basically, right? Because yeah. you're taking a pretty long round trip from wherever the input starts somewhere on the stage to down to the brain yep. to back up to what it, what your speaker processor. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, we have a bunch of base devices um, that are filled with inputs and outputs. Um, those run through fiber down to our server room. The The brain of the Nexus system is called the star. And that's where everything goes. Uh, the console brain is there. Inputs, outputs all connect via fiber, via different cards. Mm -hmm. Basically, it, it looks like a Digico SD rack, but yep. filled with stage tech. I think the obvious drawback is that new employees, even yourself, mm -hmm. come in. Like Everyone has to be trained on it, obviously. It's, yep. a, little, it's a little bit different. And then also, since... It's not something that people ever see out in the wild besides here. They're also not as familiar with how to troubleshoot it. So we were yep. talking when I came in about on the rare occasions that there is a problem, it's a big problem. Yeah. Because there's only one of them, you know, yep. for miles and miles, and people just don't have their hands on it to know how to do that advanced troubleshooting. Yep. So it's not really a question. I'm just sort of, uh, as you're talking, I'm, I'm realizing how awesome it is, but then, so, you know, sort of the, the frustrations you must have in trying to work with other people on it. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing with the control service is it's laid out like an analog desk. There is a knob, there's a rotary, there's a fader for every channel. Okay. Uh, there are layers um, in which you can rearrange those channels in, but the large desk has 56 faders on it. That's 56 EQs, 56 aux strips, uh, gain, pan, all of that is in a channel strip just like an analog desk. So if you know how to use an analog desk and if you understand you know, how a channel strip works, you can use it. Uh, we have guest engineers for concerts when we have in here, and originally, you know, every time they're like, "Oh, well, we're, we, we're going to bring in our Digico SD9," and I'm like, N -n -n "Why?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they get here, and you know, they're so overwhelmed by it, and I'm like, "All right, so at the top is your head amp. Uh -huh. This is your EQ section, low, mid, high. Here's your high pass. Here's mm -hmm. your low pass. Click it. You can change it to a shelf from a bell." whatever you want. Here's, here are your aux ends. There's eight, well, there's four rotaries, but they're double. Okay. So you have eight aux ends right there. They're labeled. Here's your fader mm -hmm. up and down. And typically for the stuff we have, it's 24 inputs. So you don't even use up the whole desk. So people end up being happy with it? People love it. Or they're still, okay. People love it. Right. You hear it and you're like, oh, this sounds great. Okay. You know, <laughs> and if these days, if you're used to a digital desk, you're used to having to page through a bunch of stuff to get to whatever it is you want. You know, select, now I can do my EQ. I need a compressor, okay, I gotta select and go over yeah. here and blah, blah, blah. You don't have to do that. It's all there, it's all in front of you. You can select and go to the center section. You know, it has, a, I'd call it a PM1D center section, if you remember what those look like mm -hmm. um, from the 90s, sure. early 2000s. Um, but uh, yeah, it looks, the center section looks a lot like that. So you can select and go to that if you want, or you can do it like an analog desk. I hope you're happy how you hurt your cause forever. I hope you think you're clever. I hope you're happy. The last thing I saw you posted on Facebook was about Noises Off. Yeah. Should we talk about that? Sure. Okay, so uh, if people don't know Noises Off. All day, ready, what's the trouble? Oh, Lloyd, you know how stupid I am about moves. Sorry, Gary. Sorry, Brooke. It's just my usual dimness, but... Why do I take the things into the study? Wouldn't it be more natural if I left them on stage? No. I've only seen the movie. Yep. Um, but it's a super fun show where basically you have a play being produced in front and all the drama going on behind. Yep. Would you talk a little bit about the design and then um, talk about where you come in to mm -hmm. the process on the project? Yeah. So Noises Off was a little unique. Um, they ended up uh, hiring... Uh, a local designer who also happens to work here at the Guthrie okay. to redesign the show. Oh, wow. Um, the director had done the show previously with a sound designer, but they had done the show before, and essentially the Guthrie bought her sound design. So they bought all of her cues, oh. all the sounds that she had created, generated, and there aren't that many of them. There's some glass breaks, there's some phone rings, and some really cheesy karaoke music. Um, gags. Gags. Um, so... It's actually not a good show to talk about because it's so unique and it'll never happen again. Okay, well, let's um, let's talk about something that represents then more your uh, more common process you would go through. Yeah, I think um, we did West Side Story here. Alicia Ba'i too uh, was the sound designer, a uh, great sound designer. Um, she lives in New York now, does a, does a bunch of stuff out there. Um, and basically we start our process six to 12 weeks before rehearsals. Mm -hmm. um, our department head, Reed, will contact the designer 
and we'll start getting preliminary information. She'll put together a rough input list, a rough output list, maybe a cue sheet, doubtful at this point because she hasn't seen the show or they haven't seen the show yet. But once we get kind of a, a rough input and output list, we will talk with the designer and tell them, okay, this is what we can do. You know, this is what you have a budget for. Um, this is what we typically do. Most of our system is installed. We have a pretty good understanding of what it is we can do and what we can't do. Mm -hmm. And if what we think they're trying to do will work or not. This season, we're doing nine shows um, in our main spaces. So we have eight outside sound designers. Uh, Christmas Carol is one of those nine. That's an inside sound designer. And some people try to reinvent the wheel. Sure. And we try to steer them kind of away from that. Typically, we add uh, a speaker system in our thrust for the band to be able to localize the band a bit better than our typical left-right. We have EAW 730s left and right, um, and they don't image very well in a thrust when the band is upstage. Um, so, so you add another system upstage closer to the band for yeah, we kind add, of a sonic image? Yeah, so mm -hmm. essentially we turn it into a 5.1 minus the surround stuff. Um, we add speakers underneath certain catwalks so that you can actually pan things left and right so that EAW left array will have the left. The speaker that ends up being in front of you gets the right signal and then a left and a right and a left and a right. Okay. Um, all the way around. Um, so when you pan, you can actually hear the pan. Because if you're sitting in a thrust, it's three quarters of the way around. You pan something left, the people on the right aren't going to hear. No, not at all. At all. <laughs> we had an arrangement uh, that we came up with that we just found didn't work very well. So the second year, we reprised that. More speakers. Um, uh, different different locations. Different placement. Um, yeah. Uh, one less speaker, actually. Okay. <laughs> uh, sometimes less is more. <laughs> Efficiency. Uh, yeah. So it uh, it it worked out better. So it's it's a lot about, you know, we know how the spaces work. We know what you can get away with. Um, we don't mic all of our shows. We only put mics on actors for the musical. And if they're a little kid, we can't expect a kid to project 120 feet to the back wall. Like, and in West Side Story, I'm guessing it's everyone. It's everyone. Yeah. 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 We had like 49... 50-ish microphones in the end. At this point in the process, you've already started all your paperwork. As soon as I get an input list and an output list uh, from the designer, I translate it into our internal paperwork. Uh, we've got a whole show folder of ground plans, sections, line diagrams. Although we don't do line diagrams for all shows. Excel docs for days. Wireless tracking. Who gets what mic? What dressing room they're in? Where's their microphone? What kind of microphone? What kind of cap? How is it attached to the hair? We start figuring all that stuff out. We don't expect the designer to figure all that out. I suppose most of them don't care how a microphone ends up on an actor. Most designers will have a say of what kind of element and where they want it to be, whether they want it center forehead, over the ear, whether, you know, if it's a boom. Handheld SM58. Yeah, this could be an interesting <laughs> version of my sad story. Um, but well. you write all that stuff down so that when you actually get into rehearsals mm -hmm. then and the A2, A3 yep. get that documentation, they can just immediately go to work and not have to figure all that stuff out. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I mean, paperwork is such a great way of communicating and for me to jot down what's in my brain. It does me no good to hold all that information inside because that means I have to do all the work. Sure, and plus you can look at what you did last year, exactly. and hopefully you made some notes there that this didn't work. Yeah, and, and then you need to try another thing. In super complex systems, it helps you with troubleshooting. If you think about a Broadway show, it's a bare stage when you walk in. So the associate and the production sound engineer design the whole system. Every connector gets a label, and in the shop. You've got, what, maybe three weeks and eight guys that you hand different pieces of paperwork to to build racks, to build bundles, to label tails. And in the end, it's all got to work. And when you first plug it in and you're like, oh, this isn't working, you can go back to the paperwork and find a pretty good starting spot of like, oh, yeah, I messed up that label. <laughs> you know, um, what uh, what software do you do your drawing in for the system and like uh, placement of speakers and stuff? AutoCAD. The the original starts in in AutoCAD, um, and then if I need to do predictions, I'll use the manufacturer specific software. Sure. So if we're Arcs, it's L Acoustics. If we're doing D and B, it'll be a Ray Calc. Um, what are you doing your uh, signal flow diagrams in that then you'll hand people in the shop to like build this thing and that thing and, and in install it? Yeah, I prefer AutoCAD just because I have a huge library. Uh, people use OmniGraffle, people use Vectorworks. 
Um, I just, I'm quicker in AutoCAD. By a li library, you mean all the units you need in there. So this kind of cable from here to here, mm -hmm. you can just put it in there. Because otherwise, AutoCAD doesn't come with like no. all these pictures of speakers and stuff like that. You have to build all no, this no, no. stuff. Yeah, you build it all. And I've just built stuff over the years. And that way, my stuff also looks consistent. So if somebody's, someone has seen my system diagram, once they've seen it once, they kind of know what is what. And then they can look at other paperwork and realize what it is. Um, USITT does a great job of having kind of consistency. You know, I think in sound, we get so frustrated by not having consistency across the board. Just to, to ADAT and SPDIF, you know, is a good example. Like, can we just pick a format, people? You know, <laughs> Blu-ray, DVD. Like, it's like, let's just pick a format. United States Institute? U yeah, United States Institute of Theater Technology. Okay. And so they have some guidelines uh, for this kind of drawing yeah. and these kind of signal flow diagrams. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, uh, a lot of colleges that are part of USITT and they then all like all the sound programs will use those diagrams to generate their signal flow. Um, would you be able to give me some images of examples of these that I could put along with the podcast so that people can kind of see what you're talking about? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I actually just had my my former professor uh, send me the updated USITT CAD blocks. Oh, I nice. can pass those along. That'd be great. So cool. So so where are we? So we're still in pre production. We haven't yep. gotten into rehearsals, but you you have an idea of what the show is going to be. You and the sound designer and all the team are in contact. So now before you even get into rehearsals, you need to prepare the system. Once we have a final design by the designer, um, and that's typically generated, you know, by a, all of us. So read our department head, um, the designer, if they have an assistant, and us. Uh, we all kind of have our little bits of say. And kind of once we have our final design in hand, uh, we'll load it in. Uh, we load in a week and a half, typically, to two weeks before tech. Because our systems are already installed, we only have to install our practicals or anything additional. If there's effect speakers, is practical obviously. sort of like a special for like when you say a special light? Is that yeah. a practical speaker? Yeah, oh, I never yeah. knew that. So okay, like, cool. it, you know, if there's a phone that needs to ring, um, that's a practical effect. It's a, got yeah. it, got it, got it. Okay. So uh, we'll install those. Obviously, if it's a musical, we'll do the pit. The orchestra actually here, which is a bit different. Um, we'll do the rehearsals down here on the first floor. Uh, we will schedule them in such a way that our operators can be in the thrust. Um, with a couple of us and maybe even the designer and we can essentially play along um and listen to the band oh, cool. in so the space the band's in rehearsal but you can mix in the yeah thrust. we can mix got it, got it, in the it. thrust so we can get a good baseline on gain stage get some good eq started you know maybe a little compression if that's what you want i guess you could also um, record them and play that back later too right and yeah have the same absolutely. effect yeah and, and you do that shh, we don't okay. do that okay um <laughs> Once the band is done rehearsing, we'll move everything upstairs to, to the, the orchestra pit okay. or wherever it is they're located. Sometimes they're on West stage. Side story was upstage. Yeah, they were okay. upstage, and it was beautiful. It was yeah. so nice to have all that space upstage. We had sixteen pieces back there. It was really nice. nice. I then have my quiet time, uh, where I then tune the system. If we added front fills, they need timing and tuning. They typically get stuck behind some sort of uh, soft good, so that set designers don't see them, which is great. You know, nothing like putting non-sound transparent fabric in front of a speaker. Sometimes they make it duvetine, and it's like, seriously? <laughs> yep. like, so, Alex needs a challenge on this one. Yeah, let's make it really hard. <laughs> um, sometimes they put them like inside step units, so then they're really nice and boomy. Wow. It's great. Cool. So you got you to gotta fix it, right? So time and tune um, in the thrust, it's anywhere between... 12 hours and 16 hours of tuning time. Um, that's across a couple of days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I split it up into 16 hours. Straight. Oh God. <laughs> um, I typically do it at night so that I have the room to myself Okay, and I don't bother people with a bunch of pink noise and tunes that they don't want to listen to. And then the designer will have their quiet time where they will listen to the system see if we need to make any modifications. I will have had a discussion with the designer on how they want it to sound, if they want it to image, where they want it to image to, what kind of qualities are they looking for. Um, every designer is kind of different. 
Tell me about the imaging conversation because yeah. uh, I have been with you in a room where you are doing a kind of imaging where you really want to reinforce the actors and have you really taking care to have the sonic image come from the stage. Mm -hmm. And the way I've seen you do that is to put a speaker on the stage that would be your actor, your mm -hmm. source in this, and then you time and level everything back to that, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. How often do you do that? And is that because you had a conversation with them about that and they said, yes, that's what I want? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that process really only happens when we have actors and microphones. For a play where there are no actors and microphones, there's no need to time and image to a source. You can, depending on what the designer wants, uh, you can just not image, mm -hmm. you know. So the people sitting in the front row will just hear a front fill. Um, the people sitting in the back will just hear an underback. Yeah, because they might be hearing ambient sounds. Correct. Rain and yep. noise. Okay. Yep. Um, but that's a discussion with the designer, right. you know, and I'm happy to do whatever. When it comes to tuning and timing and leveling underbelks, I tend to be conservative. I don't want to hear them unless I turn them off, right? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, they went away. But I don't ever want to image to an underbelk mm -hmm. or a front fill, really. I'd, I'd rather hear it as a whole system. You know, so if I close my eyes, I want it to come from everywhere and not directly from over my head or cool. down front. That's just me personally, though. So talk about this uh, this document that you use that, where you keep track of the timings. I think this is a pretty cool idea you came up with. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember exactly why you do it. It's because something about how, because you're using a source on stage, or even when you're not, mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with uh, various interactions. Yep. And you need to keep track of all of them. And so you need kind of the delta delay from various sources. So talk about this yeah, yeah, yeah. spreadsheet that you developed. Um, it's a pretty easy spreadsheet to create, but we all know that our brains can figure out delay times, right? And there's a fudge factor five, six milliseconds before your brain goes, wait a minute, that's out of time. For the thrust, I use uh, eight microphones and I move them around to over a hundred locations. And I take a time of every speaker at those locations. So say I have a microphone in seat B303, that's row B, third row in, section three, I will take a time of all the relevant speakers that hit that microphone. So if it's in the range of a front fill, I'll take the time from the front fill. I'll take the time to the source. I'll take the time to closest vocal speaker. I'll also take anything else that could hit it, our main left, right. I'll take it from arcs left, arcs right, arc center. In that spreadsheet, I can enter the delay time for a front fill, say I push it back five milliseconds, I can then see by pushing that front fill back five milliseconds in that for that microphone in that spot, what does it do to the seat C304 or wherever my next microphone is? So I can try to stay within a five, I, we use eight milliseconds here, eight milliseconds of that fudge factor, mm -hmm. you know, where our brain can kind of differentiate and image properly. So I think what Does terrified me about first seeing the spreadsheet and your in your process is uh -huh. I was thinking, oh my God, when I do a tuning, I'm trying to basically never have more than two sources arriving at equal level at any one place. Mm -hmm. But then talking to you, I think what I realized is that a lot of your process is you want to keep it documented because you're doing over a hundred measurements. Mm -hmm you're documenting all those positions and all those times so that if you get to the end and you're like, oh, wait, I need to know the time between these two things back at measurements five and six, you can just go back and look at the documentation. Yep. So it's not necessarily because you are you know, doing a spatial crossover between eight different speakers at one right. point. <laughs> you just want to have that documentation for later, right? Yeah. In case. Yeah, in case. And, you know, I want to know if I add delay to the speaker on the left, what does it do to the person sitting on the right? And then if I get a complaint from over there, it's like, oh, well, does it sound phasey, right? Are, are we canceling something out? Why is that? And we also have different systems, right? We have the EAW system, which is typically used for band and music, and then an ARCS vocal system. They're all spatially very different. In a thrust, you have three, essentially three seating planes. It's not like a, a regular audience that's just stage audience you know, there's not a clear wall there. So I want to know what the relationships are between all of them. And that 
it helps you if you're having imaging issues over here or you're having cancellation issues somewhere. Like, oh, well, this could be caused because I got 32 milliseconds of delay. Could be affecting this. Sure. And then you can play with it. You know, but then in the documentation, you, you've you gotten written down what it's supposed to be. So you can always go back. Yeah, um, I like that. Because we always A-B stuff, right? Like, even in system optimization, you're like, do I like this EQ or this EQ or this EQ? Oh, crap. What was that EQ that I did earlier? <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay, so you're going through the process here. You've, uh, you've loaded in. Mm-hmm. You've done placement and aim. And we kind of skipped over, like, verification. But you've looked at timing now. And, um, and obviously, you're doing multiple things at each mic location because you're not going to go through and do 100 mic positions just for timing and then go back and do 100 mic positions for EQ and level and things like that. At each of these positions, Mm -hmm. are you looking at solo systems and and looking at EQ and then combining it then with the whole, like you're looking at your little front fill right there and then you're combining that? And also, are you using a target trace? Walk me through how you make your EQ decisions. The original EQ decision depends on the designer. Some designers want a visually flat. If you look at it on Smart or Sim or whatever, they want it flat. Uh, I can do that. I can make it sound flat or I can make it look flat, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, some designers, designers who are more visually inclined. <laughs> yeah. Because um, okay. we all know that what sounds flat doesn't actually look flat yeah. if you look at it yeah. on a Smart Trace, right? We'll have a discussion with the designer and say, wh- which one do you want? Uh, how, how do you want it to sound? Do you want it to start, sound natural or not? And then I'll start making EQ adjustments to that. Um, I will typically EQ a front fill by itself, and then I'll add the other front fills next to it because something will happen, right? There'll be an interaction between those. They will be played together during the show, so I want to make sure that what I do will reflect the show condition. It makes no sense to just tune a front fill by itself and say, hey, but it looks flat. But the second you add eight other front fills and a main system, there are interactions. Um, so I, I will start with it by itself. And then I in the end, I will have it all together. And I will do it by system. So then I'll do a single front fill. I'll take it bigger to all the front fills. And then I'll add the mains. And I'll make sure that all of that works together as best as it can. And then I'll move to the next system. And in the end, I turn it all on. Everything that's in the vocal system will be on, and I'll redistribute the mics in specific locations, and I'll walk it, and I'll look at it, and I'll walk it, and then I'll turn smart off. And when you say look at it, you mean the graph? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Sometimes smart's a great tool, but it shouldn't be the tool. I feel like you should always use your ears. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... I find it easier to just like pinpoint something if something's like jumping out at me, but I can't quite find it with my ear. Mm -hmm. I'll look at smart and be like, oh, well, it's actually because I got too much of this and not enough of that, as Mm -hmm. opposed to I've got too much of this and not enough, you know. Um, All right. No no one listening can see your hands, but he's making (laughs) making gestures. He's Um, making uh, balancing gestures like a scale. A scale. scale. Exactly. I'll reference smart. It's also a good way to just verify what it is you're hearing because my tunings can take three days in that space your ears get tired sure you know 12 hours of pink noise slash music with few breaks in between your ears start to get accustomed to things and you stop hearing things mm-hmm. so it's a it's a good way for me over that long period of time to just verify to make sure that what I did on that side is the same that I did on this side. Also, our thrust is asymmetrical. There's a balcony under oh, one side, right. and then there's a big old ski slope on the other side. Yeah. It takes a little bit longer. So just to wrap up talking about mm-hmm. EQ, so when you kind of go down these two paths of <laughs> measures flat versus sounds flat, do you have a target trace of sounds flat, or do you just kind of know what it what you expect to see when you kind of have an expectation of what the magnitude trace should look like? Yeah, yeah, I just have, you know, just over the years, I've kind of acquired a taste of what I like to see. Okay. Um, if I look at that. Can um, you describe it? Not flat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, 150 and below. Uh, you get a, you start a little hump, and then you should be a little flattish, fairly flat till about 2K, and then you should start kind of dropping off a little bit. I have a song that I know when that sounds good, right? When What uh, song? I'm not going to share that secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's The Hunter. Come on over, my sporting friend. Bring your favorite weapon. So like when her vocal to me sounds natural 
that's kind of when I feel like it sounds flat. If you listen to Phil Collins, Tonight, Tonight, Tonight. And you get rid of the harshness in his vocal, in his S's, you're also probably there. Okay. Because he's really bright in that song. And once you kind of get rid of that bite, I feel like that's kind of where I like to be. Cool. Um, but yeah, but it's objective. You sure. know, um, over the summer when I was on tour with Lady A and Darius Rucker, it's two different sound, sound engineers, two very different ears, two very different ideas of what sounds flat. Yeah. Every night I had to make adjustments for each band. So I, I think more people are familiar with that process where you might then you're standing right next to someone mm -hmm. and you're doing your process over maybe an hour. Yep. And then you say, hey, do you like it like this or do you like it like that? Yep. So in your case, then where does that process happen? Does sound designer come in and you play something for them and you say, do you like it like this or do you like it like this? Yeah. So that's essentially the next night after I'm done with my process, the designer will come in. And sometimes they come in while I'm there, but that generally drives me nuts because <laughs> okay. they look at my spreadsheets and they look at, you know, the, the 56 different traces that I have in Smart. Um, and they're like, this is overwhelming. Sure. Um, dude, a couple shows ago, the designer came in before I had even done system verification. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that two front fills were wired out of phase. Yeah. He's like, well, that's not going to stay like that, is it? I'm like, mm, no, I <laughs> intend on fixing that. But like, they just plugged it in and it's an MM4 with a Phoenix connector on the back and the cable ain't labeled anymore. So it's not hard to fix. Yeah. But um, so I want to make sure that when when we hand a designer a system that it's as best as we think it should be as it could be and then there's the designer can say mm, i don't like it and then we'll go back to the drawing board and say well what don't you like it's pretty easy to fix at that point you know it's like oh i don't like the tonal quality of this i don't like the imaging of that and you've got two weeks of tech rehearsal so you've got time to fix it um and then sit there in tech with your ipad and or your Surface Book, or whatever it is you use um, with your system processor and make your adjustments and let the designer fine tune. But typically the designer will come in, they'll listen to a track, they'll listen to a microphone uh, through the system, see if the imaging's what they want, see if the tonal quality is what they like. If we've had band rehearsal, they've listened to the band through the system, they can tell me what they like or don't like, um, and we'll make adjustments. You know, Ultimately we're there to serve the designer, so whatever they want, we're happy to do. Tell me your measurement trace naming procedure, because one of the hardest things for me in the field is when I'm trying to work quickly and I'm naming a bunch of traces mm -hmm. and then I come back and I want to look at where I started or I want to look at something that I did and I'm like, oh, I, I didn't name it properly. I don't know what this trace is. Or maybe I'm looking at yeah. it a few weeks later. Uh, how do you keep track of all those traces? Uh, I start with the uh, seat location. So row and then seat number. Um, and then what speaker I am measuring. So a typical trace name will be F202 at ARCS Center. So that lets me know I measured, took a measurement in that seat, and I measured that speaker. What happens if you do two of them? Like if you take that measurement and then make a change, and then you take another measurement? I'll, I'll usually say A or B. Okay. If I, if I take multiples for the rock and roll stuff, I create two different folders. I create a before and an after so that I have, this is what the system started out to be. And this is what it is now. Let's move on and, and sort of then compare, maybe we can now compare and contrast with yeah. the Lady Antebellum tour. So first of all, how did you get the gig? Yeah, so I got the gig uh, through special event services. Uh, they're a system provider out of North Carolina. I uh, started working for them in college. Um, the the tour, it was a co-headline between Darius Rucker and Lady A. Um, and so production managers uh, kind of hashed it out as to who got to choose what system. Mm. So like Lady A got to pick trucking and lighting and set. And the Darius Rucker camp got to choose the sound company and video and or, you know, whatever they ended up 
choosing. So um, they both agreed and they put out bids to a bunch of different companies, uh, same system spec as LQ6, K1, K2, uh, KS28s, and a bunch of amps. Okay. SES won the won the contract. So since I've I've been working for Darius since before it was Darius, okay. uh, <laughs> when it was still hooting the blowfish, okay. uh, I started with him in like, oh, three as a patch guy slash lighting tech. Um, they were doing large clubs and casinos at the time. Um, and I've been on and off with them since then. Uh, so I've, I have a r- pretty good relationship with their production manager and their front of house guy. When the call came to SES, uh, Billy Hewlin, their front of house guy, asked if I could be their systems tech and um, sat down with, uh, with Billy and Scoop, the front of house guy for Lady A, and had a conversation. Uh, because Scoop doesn't know me, uh, didn't know me at the time. You know, it's we wanted to make sure that we were all kind of on the same page cool. and have some form of introduction. And so that I I would know what to expect from him. You know, it's such a close relationship between a systems engineer and the front of house guy. Um, you want to make sure that you click and that you're not going to be fighting each other for the next three months. Cool. It's just miserable. Yeah. So, so uh, you knew the front of house engineer and he recommended you. He requested yeah, you. Yeah, essentially. He, he and the like, other and he. You basically needed to get buy-in from the other sound engineers that, yeah, I like him too. <laughs> yeah, essentially, you okay. know, because uh, it's a co-headliner. It's not, Lady A was not the sole headliner. Darius wasn't the sole headliner. Like, it it was a truly shared thing, which is unusual. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually it's, you know, Luke Bryant featuring blah, 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 blah. Yeah. People I've not heard of. Right. The tour is actually called Summer Plays On Tour and not the Lady A tour or the Darius Rucker tour. Yeah. It was the Summer play- so, yeah. When you got the call, you must have thought to yourself, I'd love to do this gig. How am I going to do this gig? Because mm-hmm. you're full time here mm-hmm. at the Guthrie. You, just, yep. you said you're nine to five. You were able to make it work without getting a divorce. Yep. And congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how did you make that work? Yeah. Uh, well, one, I have a rock star wife uh-huh. and a pretty awesome boss. Awesome. When I started here, I made it clear that you will only keep me here as long as you let me leave. As weird as that sounds, I have never held a job longer than a year. If you think about most tours, they last like three months. Mm-hmm. Now, I've had relationships with clients that have lasted longer, but most rock and roll tours don't last that long. Broadway contracts don't last that long. So this was like really my first full-time sit-down job. Mm-hmm. And I get bored. <laughs> I get really bored really quickly. So I need challenges. And a great way to have a challenge is to do something else. It also keeps you relevant. It's one thing with like teaching that can drive me nuts is a lot of teachers tend to just teach and aren't out there anymore. So they're teaching the things that they did 20 years ago. Um, so I think it's, it's really important to stay current and stuff changes, you know, uh, ways of doing things change. Could you just give an example of like something that you learned on this tour that otherwise, if you were just here at the Guthrie, you wouldn't know. Something that was particular to to Lady A is Hillary, um, who's a who's a lovely person, um, one of the lead singers for uh, Lady A. Um, doesn't like low end on stage at all. That's not something I've had to really deal with in the past. When I've been out with Darius and other people, they're like, "Man, it's fine. It is what it is." Right. So uh, a challenge we had was how do we eliminate that without eliminating the sound in the front. And creating a bunch of lobes and other things like that. So I learned a lot about low end control, mm-hmm. uh, what to do, what not to do. Sure, uh, you know um, how different types of stages affect that and can affect that. You were posting a lot of photos mm-hmm. uh, about the different installations that you were doing, and I think remember, I think I remember getting the sense that you were trying some different things. Yeah. Uh, what did you? Can you talk about the array that you settled on in the end that you found worked the best to to accomplish this? Yeah, so I don't think that we ever it changes per venue. Okay, right? uh, we played um, a, a beautiful shed in in upstate New York where the subs sit on a wooden orchestra pit. And they can't go on stage because they block sight lines. Uh, they can't go in the air because um, there's not enough rigging points. It's a fairly small venue. So the sub setup we ended up folk having there was very different than what we had in other venues. Um, 
the venue in Guilford, New Hampshire. Love the venue, but it's a sub trap. We ended up doing something different there. And it was really cool from this front of house guys to allow me to mess up once and then give me the time to fix it. We ended up doing something uh, kind of weird uh, in Guilford where we had two stacks facing forward and one kind of 90 off to the side. I think I remember seeing that photo, yeah. Um, and it actually worked really well. Uh, you know, played around with timing and uh, turning some subs backwards in cardioid fashions, and it actually worked really well. It got the sub off the deck and the thrust, which was massive, um, and yet kept it in the audience. There, There's compromises, for sure. You so you know. were able to keep it in the audience because you were able to make the footprint smaller. Yeah, essentially. You know, we ended up shooting a lot of sub off to the sides where there weren't people, but there weren't people and there wasn't a wall. So I didn't really care. Okay. <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it actually worked out really well. But our typical setup was uh, three subs on carts, uh, stack three high horizontally with the bottom one cardioid with a two foot gap in between each stack. When you say bottom on cardioid, you mean bottom one facing backwards Correct. and out of polarity. So is it yep. inverted gradient stack? Is that what that's called? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So th- we found, uh, you know, a couple times we pushed them together to see what that would do. We had a one foot gap. We had a two foot gap. We had a three foot gap. We had four sets, you know, um, four high stacks of four high um, in a couple venues um, cause the venues are really tall. So we wanted to get a bit more vertical where we ended up actually like delaying the top two subs a little bit differently. So we could just kind of try to steer it up. It, we're, we're kind of, uh, sound vision's great at predicting some stuff, but like any prediction software, there's a lot of things it doesn't take into account. Mm-hmm. Like what the room is made out of, sure. you know, what is the roof made out of? What does it actually do? The reason I take pictures of every system is because I want to remember it. So when I'm there next time, and I will, I will, in each of my show folders, I have a notepad document that says, this worked or this didn't work. Mm-hmm. Don't do this again. Okay. <laughs> um, hopefully next time I'm in those venues, I can either completely recreate what I did because it worked really well or say, oh, that didn't work. Maybe next time don't hang a side hang. What does didn't work mean? Do you discover that while you're sort of in your optimization process or do you discover that when the show starts and the sound engineer looks at you and you're like, oh, how, well, what does, does it work Hopefully you know that before me? then. You're always limited by what's in the truck sure. and what you have available to you. Uh, and you do the best with that as you can. I think the best example is one venue, I didn't hang a side hang. I hung a bunch of K2s because I thought it would be enough horizontal coverage. Well, it turns out the last four seats on the ends really suffered but because i used all my k2s up in the air i didn't have anything for a side hang or even like a ground stack that i could like point in that direction mm-hmm. so in that show file i wrote uh you you need something to fill the gap mm-hmm. k2s don't really work Got it. prediction software says it would but in reality it doesn't cool um so hopefully you find out Hopefully I figured that out before I hand the system over to the engineer Mm -hmm. and he goes walking over there and goes, uh, there's a big old gap. Sometimes (laughs) there's something you can do about it. You know, sometimes there isn't. We ended up taking a stack of K1 and rolling it down front and pointing it in that direction, right? Way overkill, not ideal. Don't put a K1 eight feet away from an audience member. Like, (laughs) not a good idea. Um, But we were able to turn down, you know, turn off the bottom two boxes and kind of overshoot and best compromise for that situation. Sure. Would I do it again? I'd put up a whole different system. Really? Okay. Well, yeah, I'd I'd either do a main and a side hang or bring a different set of boxes. You know, maybe a Kara ground stack or a couple arcs or a point source, you know, whatever. Yeah. Just something to fill the gap. Without going through all those same steps for this last tour, mm-hmm. can we pick out a few things that you were doing that you do differently when you're on the road or you do differently for rock and roll? The systems here are installed. The systems on tour are not. Each venue is different. You're completely redesigning the sound system from ground up every day. Yeah. You know, um, Granted, you're stuck with whatever it is you have in the truck. But you're doing that every day. You're loading in every day. My different, days, different limitations. Yeah, different limitations. You're still in service of someone. So that's the same. You know, here I'm in service of the sound designer, essentially. There I'm in service of the production manager and the front of house engineer. Um, and my job is to make them happy 
and make sure that what they hear happens everywhere else, which is the same in both. You know, the designer sits in a at a tech table and when they want more of a violin in this spot, I want it to sound the same everywhere else. So that's the same. You know, um, I think my job is part of my job is to make sure that what the engineer hears at front of house is replicated for the other 15, 16,000 people that are there to the best of my abilities. I get up at 6.30 on tour, measure the room, 7 o'clock, mark out the floor with the riggers, got to find power, you know. it's One thing I find is fascinating is a lot of people, like, always focus on, like, well, where's front of house going to go? Where Where's this going to go? Where are all my boxes going to go? People completely forget about power. <laughs> And then, like, the truck dumps. What do you mean? Like, getting power to front of house? Uh, the disconnect. Where, where's the system getting oh, its power? Oh, right, right. Right. I, I did a tour, and I was just I was just a PA tech. Like, my only job was to put boxes up in the air. Mm-hmm. Nothing else. I was supposed to get feeder from the guy over on stage right, and he never knew where the disconnect was. So, every morning, I'd walk in and go, okay, where's the disconnect? And half the time, it was on my side. <laughs> so, Yeah. And so then he would run feeder all the way across the back to his distro and then over to mine. I'm like, that seems silly. Right. Like, why don't we just hit me first and then loop through me to get to, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's such a, you can put all the speakers in the air, but you're not going to do any with anything with them without. Power. And it's a big concern because uh, power is heavy. Yeah. That's heavy cable. Um, what about when you're doing concert sound? What are you looking for on the graph? The first couple of nights after the show was over and the audience cleared out, I put Pink back through the noise, stuck a mic at his head height, and took a measurement. Mm -hmm. Whether I agreed with what that trace looked like doesn't really matter to me in the end. Mm -hmm. But so then after that, I start kind of aiming for that trace. Because I know in the end, that's where he's going to end up. And did that work? Was that kind of like, if I can put a microphone there again that next night and I recreate something similar... You found that he said, oh, it sounds like it sounds good. It sounds like last night. Did you get were you able to get those results? Uh, sometimes, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with how he's doing that day. Sure. Um, if he's sick or if there's something else that happened. I don't think the trace is the end all be all. Right. If he says it looks the same, but it doesn't sound the same. That can totally be true. Sure. Hearing um, is easily influenced by everything else. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's a decent starting point. I don't get offended if that's not where you end up the next night. At the beginning, when we when I first started doing this, he would have me take out my system EQ. So I would I would shoot and I would EQ and it would you know essentially his trace would look identical and be like eh take it out and then he would do his EQ on his system through his lake, uh-huh. um, and we usually end up within ninety percent of where I ended up. Uh-huh. There may be a couple things. Um, I try to be very conscious of hacking away too much. I think if, if you hack at something and then something else pops out and then you hack at that and something else pops out, that's not really the issue. Yeah. Um, so start over. I, I feel like if I have more than six EQ cuts in a system, I did something wrong. And there was one venue, we had like some massive buildup right at like 670. And I was like, where is this coming from? Well, it comes. turns out during sound check, he turned off the side hangs. Oh. So then he comes back at night and the side hangs are back on and I didn't catch it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it was a super busy day. I had my hands full with other stuff uh-huh. and I didn't catch that he had turned the side hangs off for his sound check. Interesting. And suddenly there's this 670 that is just bugging the daylights out of both of us. <laughs> and I'm walking around left and right and left and right. I'm like, oh. Yeah, okay. You know, because you can hear that go in and out, you know, mm-hmm. that that addition. I mean, it's super blatant. And I had a really great guy out, uh, John Kaler. He's a guy I've learned a lot from. He's like, move your delay by like 0. 0.01 on the mains. And it changed. I was like, oh, yep, yeah, bad timing. Wow. And so out on the road, that whole process is sped up. But mm-hmm. also, it seems, sounds like you're working more hand in hand with someone who's kind of involved in your process. Absolutely. Yeah. I think... I would be sad if a front of house engineer wasn't part of the process. It got a little challenging when you have two different engineers that want two different things out of a system. Mm. Um, that was challenging. Um, well, they. What were some of the differences? Like 
you would actually load different settings for different mm -hmm. parts of the performance? Okay. Yeah, so for the Lady A set, I had a set of um, EQ curves. We used a, a processor called an Outline Newton. Okay. It was brand new. We were the first tour out with it. Wow, I've never um, heard of it, yeah. It's, it's an Italian uh, speaker manufacturer that make the Outline GTO. Okay. Great speaker box. Um, the L Acoustics P1 wasn't out yet. Otherwise, I would have used a P1. Okay. <laughs> um, to do this on a lake wasn't feasible. I, I can't matrix three different consoles into a lake. I want We wanted to go digital, uh, digital in, digital out, streamlined as possible yeah. with the analog fallback. Um, but the Newton really was instrumental to us being able to have three consoles live at once. You know, we had the, we had the opener, uh, Russell Dickerson, then Darius Rucker and Lady A. And there were moments when this whole thing first started that we would need to have all three consoles live at once. You can't do that with a lake. It would have, I would have needed like 10 lakes wow. just to do the system processing and all that. So we're like, no, no, no. So we found this outline Newton and it was great. Um, one thing you can do in a Newton is you've got different pages uh, for presets and they're really easy to bypass and engage. So for, I had a, a filter tab for Lady A, a filter tab for Darius Rucker, and a filter tab for Russell Dickerson. And then during set change, you know, there's usually that split second where you're switching over between house music and, uh -huh. you know, preset. the, the, the <laughs> act. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You just bypass one, disengage the other. And, you know, all consoles sound different. Darius Rucker uh, camp is on uh, Midas Pro X's. Um, Lady A was on an Avid S6L, and then mm -hmm. Russell Dickerson was on an X32. Oh, wow. Um, they all have different sonic characteristics that process sound differently. Mm -hmm. So in the end, the system ends up sounding different because their systems are different. Mm -hmm. um, you were kind of the last step in the chain mm -hmm. to make that all work together. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I really didn't want the engineers to use their own processing. I don't like layering filter on top of filter on top of filter, mm -hmm. you know, or processor on top of processor. Because if they're doing something and I don't know about it and I hear something that's like, oh, this ain't right. And I fix it in mine and then they go to theirs and change something in their process. Like, I that doesn't work. <laughs> like, if there's something you don't like, tell me about it. Yeah. And or if there's something I don't like, I will tell you about it. And you can tell me if you want me to do something about it. I'm not going to change it on you. I think that's a no, no. Like in the middle of a show, don't. Don't suddenly take 4K and dip it to dB. They'll hear it. Mm -hmm. um, I did that once. Didn't turn out well. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> lesson learned. Yeah, lesson learned. <laughs> like, if you're going to change the system on an engineer, they should know about it before right. you do it. And don't do it in the middle of the song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like before tablets were, like, really good at Wi-Fi, you know, connections. And it was on an XTA, and I had, I had grabbed an EQ filter somewhere and like slammed it all the way down. So suddenly 4K was out. It was like at minus 22. This is a show in the past. This is a show in the past. Yeah. And <laughs> like the look I get from the engineer was Yikes. like, I'm about to murder you. Oh my God. Uh, each act had its own EQ setting to, I'm putting quotes around this, fix the mix. Make it sound like one show, not. Yeah. Uh, not three, three different. different I mean, it is three different shows, but you don't want them to sound violently different. Yeah. Sonically. And, yeah. Okay. Talk about some of the tools that you bring with you in your work bag. I know you probably have a lot, but what are some that you think are maybe more interesting mm -hmm. uh, or unique? I'm actually a minimalist. I carry a cue box. I carry one RTA mic um, and a Disto slash rangefinder. Okay. Um, what mic do you have? I, I have an M30. And uh, what, Earthworks. what disto do you have? I have a Leica D30. So the... D60, something. Teach me how to do things outside in the daylight. Hmm. Range finders. Range finders. Yeah, it's... Um, That's like a forestry tool. Yep, exactly. Uh, it's um, I have the Nikon Forestry Pro. Um, it is meant for people who work out in the woods to measure trees. Right. It's also really good at measuring distances in the daylight. Or really long distances. Or really right? long distances, right? Like you're a Leica, if you don't have the camera, the Leica with the camera on it, so you can still see where you're pointing that laser, right? Mm -hmm. Once that laser goes away, you're like, well, I have no idea what I'm hitting right now. Right. So what so is So if you can't distance? see the laser or if it's too far, you need a range finder. Yeah. And how does that work? 
Uh, it's the same way. Um, oh, okay. the, the I was afraid you have to like look through a telescope and yeah. then, like make some calculations. It's a monocular. The really cool thing about the Forestry Pro um, is that it has its own internal computer and it can do your height and uh, your Pythagorean theorems all internally. Mm -hmm. So you can point it at something and it will give you your horizontal distance, your vertical distance, and your straight line shot all in one. So it gives you all the measurements you need for sound vision or array calc Mm -hmm. uh, in one shot. You feel a little bit like a sniper when you're using it. Um, (laughs) And uh, what audio interface are you using for your audio analyzer? Uh, personally, I have a USB Pre 2. Um, sound? Sound devices. Sound devices. Yep. I asked the shop to provide me with a computer with smart and an interface. If I do that, I ask for a Motu 18i2. That doesn't mean you're moving the microphone around a lot, and then if you make a change, you've got to go back to those positions? And... I only carry one. I ask them to provide others. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. okay. Um, I, I carry one, and that's the one that sits by me, right? I have the correction curve for it. I know the characteristics of the microphone. On tour, I ended up with four microphones. The ISEMCON, what's the model number? 7150. That one. Mm-hmm. Um, they provided cool. four of those. Nice. And then I had my own. Um, Electrosonics, uh, R400s. Uh, wireless transmitters, so I wasn't schlepping cables everywhere. Oh, cool. Um, That was really handy. It made for a really good rig. That's what I would like to have. It's what I asked them to provide. If they don't, I'm not offended. Cool. Because that's a lot of money. Is there any books that you could recommend that have been helpful to you? This is obviously Bob McCarthy's book, right? I feel like every sound engineer should read that book and keep it on hand. I sometimes bring it along. Um... Sometimes there's things you want to refresh on. The first book on sound I ever read was the Yamaha Sound Reinforcement Classic. Handbook. Classic. Where's the best place for people to follow your work if they want to see what you're doing? Yeah, I think uh, I post most of my stuff on LinkedIn and Facebook. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Sound Design. I have a new book. Master Your Craft, Essays and Interviews on Sound System Tuning with Bob McCarthy, Mauricio Ramirez, Merlin Bambin and Jamie Anderson is in its third edition. It has new interviews with people like Jamie Anderson and Chris Tangiris from Rational Acoustics and a lot of updated content based on the things I've learned over the last two or three years. You can get it over at sounddesignlive.com. Just click on training. Pro Audio Workshop Seeing Sound, my online course on sound system tuning is currently open for enrollment and it will be open until Monday, May 20th. I want to thank Sulagna Handik for the music in today's episode. If you want to find more of their music, just head over to sounddesignlive.com. Find the show notes for this podcast by searching for Alex Ritter, and you'll find a link there to their SoundCloud page. Sound Design Live is supported by Learn Stage Lighting, Ryan, Bob, Martin, Michael, Roadie Free Radio, Joel, Ellis, Senqui, Nicholas, Nicholas, Kuba, Chris, DC Sound Op, and Dave. And you can start supporting Sound Design Live for as little as $1 today over at patreon.com slash sounddesignlive.